In the September 1976 issue of Playboy, David Bowie calls Adolf Hitler one of the first rock stars, comparing the Fuhrer to Mick Jagger in the way he, quote, worked an audience. In talking about the power of his stardom in the Ziggy Stardust persona, Bowie told Rolling Stone he'd be a, quote, bloody good Hitler. Bowie's statements came only a month after Eric Clapton's drunken onstage rant in support of conservative MP Enoch Powell, in which Clapton is alleged to have said, quote, stop Britain from becoming a black colony, and, quote, keep Britain white, while throwing in a few slurs for those who still didn't pick up on the thesis of this statement. Clapton's statements were so inflammatory that members of agitprop theater group Cartoon Clowns, itself an offshoot of Cartoon Archetypal Slogan Theater, or CAST, were inspired to start a music promotion group in opposition to such sentiment. Quick sidebar. Around this time, Susie Sue and Sid Vicious, among others, sported a sort of Nazi-chic look with swastika-emblazoned outfits. This was characteristic of early UK punk and done in the name of High Camp. It was meant to shock and offend just for the sake of shock and offense, not as a statement of support for Hitler's Nazi party. We here at This Month in Punk Rock History are only here to present the facts and not to promote or defend any ideology. Rock Against Racism promoted multicultural rock, jazz, reggae, and punk shows in small clubs as well as demonstrations and festivals in large parks throughout England. The message of this carnival not only to the loonies of the National Front, but to all bigots everywhere, is hands off our people! Black, white, together, tonight and forever! The catchy name became a template for festivals and movements to follow. Not only was there rock against racism, there was rock against sexism, rock and roll against the dole, new wave against black lung, and rock against... concrete? There was no shortage of charitable causes in the 70s and 80s. Then came Rock Against Communism, which, as it turns out, has very little to do with opposing communism. Rock Against Communism, or RAC, started as a promotion and grew to become a euphemistic genre description for white power, punk, oi, and hardcore. By 1992, the domestic scene was fading, so promoters put together a show meant to reinvigorate it. But the very presence of the bands, or supporters, was so inflammatory that organizers employed sleight-of-hand tactics to keep the details on the down-low. So how would anyone know where to go? Well, London's Waterloo Station was advertised as a sort of waypoint from where concertgoers could obtain transportation for the final destination. That could have gone better. Hi everybody, Brendan here with another edition of This Month in Punk Rock History. It's September 2023, and this month in punk rock history, we take a look at a Rock Against Communism gig that was unsuccessfully preempted by a street battle between anti-fascists and Nazi skins at London's Waterloo Station on September 12, 1992. But first... Hi, I'm Sweet Jimmy Cook. You might remember me from such things as the Sweet Jimmy Network, or the Sweet Jimmy Network on TikTok. I'm here today to ask for your help. My equipment is in disrepair. I'm definitely due for a systemic upgrade. It's not my style to beg. Um, and let's face it, some of these Kickstarter people use the money for their own selfish games. So I'm not going to ask you guys for money and then we're off to California or some bullshit. To support my eBay store, which is also called the Sweet Jimmy Network. Pretty astute planning on my part. Anyway, come check it out. I got robots, monsters, horror stuff. So thank you for your support. And now back to Brendan. Okay, where to start? I'm not getting into the complete history of racism, or the history of anti-fascism, or even the history of skinhead, but these are all older than you might suspect. Something else to keep in mind, the infiltration of far right-wing politics into the skinhead and punk scenes was intentional. Why do you think the British movement are bothering to recruit skinheads? Because they can't get anybody else. Yes! 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 Yes!
Brothers, sign up today. Thank you very much. Yes! White power organizations such as the National Front and British Movement made a conscious decision to utilize youth movements to help spread their messages. This tactic is nothing new, but again, I will not get into the entire history of radicalizing disaffected youth. So, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't necessarily a square. Got it? Alright, it's the mid-70s UK, where the economy was in the toilet, there were no jobs, and suddenly everything is more expensive. Looking to shift attention away from complex and nuanced economic policies, politicians place the blame on foreigners. So here we have a perfect storm. The emergence of exciting new countercultures, skinhead and punk, social isolation, struggling economy, and rock stars echoing politicians who blame non-whites. Enter the main character of today's story, Ian Stewart Donaldson. The son of a tool and dye maker in the northwest of England, Donaldson first fell in love with rock and roll when he saw the Rolling Stones on top of the Pops. He eventually started his own Stones-heavy pub rock group called Tumbling Dice. Like so many others, Donaldson and his bandmates were transformed after witnessing the Sex Pistols in action at that group's second Manchester show. Donaldson said he liked the sound, but not the politics, and Tumbling Dice quickly adopted a new, more aggressive sound. They quickly cut a punkish demo, sending copies to labels throughout the country. And just as one copy arrived at the doorstep of Ted Carroll's Rock On record shop, home to indie label Chiswick, the dice ceased to tumble. But news traveled slow in those days, and Chiswick co-founder Roger Armstrong traveled from London to the Blackpool suburbs to find this group, and invited them to London to record for the label. They hastily reassembled and cut their first single, but they needed a name. Choosing from a list provided by Chiswick, the band adopted the moniker Screwdriver, spelled with a K. They went on to cut three singles and an LP for Chiswick, as well as an EP for TJM Records before playing their final gig on New Year's Day, 1979. Now let's jump back into Rock Against Communism. A movement conceived within and supported by the far-right National Front, RAC was founded in direct opposition to Rock Against Racism. Founder Joe Pierce recognized the power of popular music when he witnessed how quickly Rock Against Racism and the Anti-Nazi League were able to mobilize thousands of young people. Pierce, who had been editor of National Front's Bulldog magazine, teamed up with Eddie Morrison, who had just published Punk Front, which he describes as a, quote, spoof fanzine, complete with safety-pinned NF logo. Together, they founded Rock Against Communism. It was around this time that Donaldson officially joined the National Front. According to Pierce, Donaldson remained in London for a time with hopes of reforming Screwdriver, but couldn't quite work it all out, so he returned to Blackpool. Meanwhile, Pierce was working on finding the right lineup for the first Rock Against Communism gig. With YNF-supported bands The Dentist and White Boss, the Rock Against Communism kickoff event took place on August 18, 1979 at Conway Hall in Red Lion Square, the site of a 1974 skirmish between marching National Front members and counter-protesters which ended with one death. Days before the event, Pierce wrote that Screwdriver had backed out, but according to his memoir, there was no Screwdriver at the time. The concert was not quite the spectacular launch that Pierce had hoped for, and RAC struggled to gain momentum. Until... The return of Donaldson and his newly reformed screwdriver. Now, I cannot stress this enough. Yes, it's Ian Stewart Donaldson. Yes, it's a skinhead punk band called Screwdriver, but it's not the same band. This is Screwdriver 2.0. Brought to you by the National Front. Literally. The newspaper headline pictured in Paul London's book reads, Quote, front behind punk group. The story of Screwdriver Mark II was that every show was either uneventful or ended in full-scale riot. So Screwdriver was back with a bang. Capitalizing on the existing skinhead fan base, Donaldson and the National Front used the band as a recruitment tool. According to Pierce, Screwdriver breathed new life into the struggling Rock Against Communism movement with their first RAC gig drawing a crowd of about 500. Pierce founded White Noise Records, which became a sort of subgroup within the National Front. He and his followers would come to embrace a slightly different ideology, which eventually led to a split within NF. 
Later accusing the label of financial mismanagement, Donaldson abandoned White Noise and its parent National Front and, along with friend Nicky Crane, started his own label, Blood and Honor. Described in its official history as the independent voice of the right-wing resistance movement, Blood and Honor takes its name from a Nazi slogan found on Hitler Youth uniforms and paraphernalia. This new promotion was independent of the NF or any other existing organization. Blood and Honor picked up Pierce's RAC monopoly on promoting white power music in the UK and Europe. Earlier I showed footage from the Battle of Cable Street. About 50 years after that event, militant anti-fascism was on the rise again in response to militant fascism but it was a disorganized bunch of disparate groups throughout Great Britain. In 1986, they organized into anti-fascist action, bent on shutting down the National Front and similar groups by any means necessary. By 1988, Blood and Honor were booking gigs nearly every two weeks regularly. The venues became targets for AFA attacks, and it became standard practice to book gigs with some subterfuge. Typically, this involved lying about the names of the bands and of the management, and sometimes booking decoy gigs to throw off the scent for the AFA. What's the name of the place? Uh, the name of the place is, uh, Bob's Country Bunker. Here we are. Bob's Country Bunker? By 1992, Blood and Honor activity had slowed. Internal conflict, financial mismanagement, and a coup in the making had weakened the movement. In effort to revive the organization, a big concert was announced with Screwdriver at top of the bill. Once more, the venue wasn't listed on the flyers and the waypoint was advertised as Waterloo Station. Waterloo! An ad campaign like no other was undertaken. Flyers were posted throughout the country, local and national media outlets were informed, and, according to B&H's account of the event, undercover supporters, feigning concern, went to key anti-fascist leaders to warn them. Donaldson was allegedly attacked the night before the gig while at a pub in Nottingham. The B&H website says he was glassed in the face, resulting in the loss of a few teeth and the addition of a few stitches. Finally, the day had arrived. Uh, I, the Duke of Dublin, find you. The English have reached Waterloo. Good, prepare to attack. The tension in the air was palpable. At first, according to most accounts, the police mostly stood by and allowed small fracases to resolve themselves. Rachel Borrell's report in The Independent says trouble started with the arrival of about 100 neo-Nazis. Gary Bushell says early neo-Nazi turnout was around 500. Thanks to a recent Unity Carnival, AFA ranks were swelling with new recruits. Sources on both sides estimate around 1,000 anti-fascists showed up that day. Small groups of neo-Nazis arrived by train, by bus, by car, and on foot and were quickly attacked by anti-fascists or escorted away by police. Each side accused the police of protecting the other. According to B&H, just as AFA had them on the ropes, backup arrived in the underground in the form of two hooligan firms on the 315 train from Reading. Meanwhile, on the surface, unaffiliated right-wing football casuals showed up to outnumber the AFA. Boy, your boy's a flopper, he is! No, he isn't, he isn't! Your mother can kiss me, Bob! <laughs> All the while, Combat 18, a group politically aligned with B&H, mostly sat back and watched the events unfold. Citing the level of publicity leading up to the event, Sean Burchill writes, quote, Waterloo appeared to be designed as a kind of showdown. The reality was that it was more of a ruse, more of a misdirection than a redirection. When 20-year-old Matthew Collins and his friend Nicky arrived at Waterloo Station, violence was well underway. It resembled a battleground, Collins writes. We were greeted by the sight of bloodied skinheads, while panicked passengers ran for cover. Collins recalls anti-fascist reinforcements coming behind him as he led a tactical retreat to Elephant and Castle, which is apparently a place. There they regrouped to find a way to the final destination of their journey. Various newspaper reports list as many as 44 arrests, 17 were sent to the hospital, at least one skinhead had a heart attack, two cops, some bystanders, and two cars sustained injury. Service was temporarily halted at Waterloo and at least one other station. According to Gary Bushell, one police officer on the scene likened the event to Custer's last stand. General Custer, can he save them? <laughs> Evidently not. Perhaps missing the more obvious historical reference. 
In addition, one eyewitness account recalls overhearing someone brag that they had, quote, closed more stations than the IRA. Meanwhile, those in the know met up at South Mims service station before continuing to the Yorkshire Grey in Eltham for the actual concert. This month in punk rock history was able to obtain exclusive footage from inside the venue. Victory here is hard to define. Naturally, both sides claim success. AFA didn't prevent the concert from taking place, which was their stated goal, so Blood and Honor claims victory. But by most other accounts, it was an AFA victory in the sense that Blood and Honor, as an organization, was seriously wounded that day. Win or lose, the 1992 Battle of Waterloo overshadowed any revival B&H hoped to gain from the actual concert. I alluded earlier to a coup in the making, and I mentioned that Combat 18 stood on the sidelines. Lowell's writes, The Waterloo fiasco had been a blow for the organizers, and C-18 was quick to take advantage. Now split from the British National Party, Combat 18 seized control of blood and honor, leading the next generation of white supremacists away from hooliganism and towards paramilitary extremism. Coca-Cola says it's the real thing. But Pepsi-Cola believes that when it comes to colas, the only real thing is taste. That's why the Pepsi Challenge has been asking thousands of people across the country to let their own taste decide. The group became increasingly violent and is now recognized as a terrorist organization by the Canadian government, is banned in Germany, and its members are barred from public service in the UK. First time Canada has added two right-wing extremist groups to the list of terror organizations. The neo-Nazi groups Blood and Honor and Combat 18 are now considered terrorist entities in this country. When the Führer says, he is the master race, be high. That's it for a look at the 1992 Battle of Waterloo Station. Corrections, comments, insights, info, always welcome. And join me next month for the greatest crossover since Hitler and Stalin shared a cartoon. Name the special guest star in the comment section below and be automatically entered for a chance to win. I'm just kidding. If a skinhead arrives at your door, it's a 100% coincidence. Please don't sue us. We have no money anyway. In the meantime, check out my half-assed attempt to chronicle the day-by-day -day events of the scene and push the limits of Zuckerberg's cybersecurity protocols via tiprh.start.page. For this month in punk rock history, I'm Brendan McCabe.